Good afternoon and thank you for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Slaw. I'm an inside systems engineer here at Veeam Software. And today we're going to go through uh, some best practices and deployment of backup and replication. Um, so just a few housekeeping rules before we get into it. Um, all microphones will be muted during the duration of this session. If you do have any questions at any point, go ahead and throw those into the question box uh, that you have access to at any point. So I'll be happy to answer those. Usually what happens, I'll do a uh, kind of a run through with some slides uh, here to explain some of the things um, to look out for when it comes to deploying Veeam, some of the best practices, and then we'll do a demo session where I can happily answer those questions and we can learn together. Uh, personally, I'm a, a visual learner, um, so we can definitely answer those, show you how it works inside of Veeam and really get into it. So uh, let's kick this thing off with a brief explanation for anybody that is not familiar with backup and replication. Um, one of the things that we're going to be looking at today is the availability suite, which is Veeam backup and replication and Veeam 1. The com combination of both of those equals the availability suite. And of course, some of the key capabilities that we offer in this solution here is, of course, the advanced backup and recovery, uh, intelligent monitoring, governance and compliance. There's a lot of that going on these days, especially with the new work from home environments. You know, as that changes, so do the compliances of those uh, environments. Uh, hybrid cloud enablement as well, so flexible cloud coverage, giving you the ability to send data to the cloud as copies or restore VMs to the cloud as well. So having a hybrid setup for recovery and backup is great. And of course, built-in replication. So if anybody out there has disaster recovery needs, and um, we'll get into some of those key disasters that may happen, uh, are quite common. Um, and the ability to spin up VMs in other locations and other data centers, uh, physical on-prem data centers, of course, uh, within a few clicks, having those couple of clicks or one click failovers available to you. Um, so that is the availability suite. And again, that is what we're going to focus on today for some of these best practices. But we'll start off with some definitions and considerations. Now, uh, really, this is just a general understanding and overview, a top-down view of some of the, some of the things you can should consider during a deployment of Veeam, right? So when installing Veeam, some of the thought points uh, and focus points uh, to look out for. So first, we do the basics for deployment, assess for success. So before you start designing and deploying backup replication, there are some things we need to have available to us to get a good, solid, and clean deployment uh, of backup and replication. One of those things is the amount of data. Okay, so it's very important to have an understanding of that. Reason is, of course, when we're backing up, we need a storage location, right? We need enough storage to not only hold the initial falls that we may perform, but also retain the data for an extended period of time. So we all have retention policy settings or requirements. Uh, if we're in the medical industry, of course, we have a retention requirement of seven years, just as an example. Okay, so you need enough storage to cover that seven year window and then some, right? So for overhead. So we need a clear understanding of how much raw data we're going to protect, whether it's from VMs, so VM data or file level data or even NAS data if you're looking to back up your file share devices or file servers. Okay, so getting that raw number is very important. Along with that, that goes hand in hand with the amount of data is the daily change rate. Now the daily change rate, of course, is uh, basically every day, you know, VMs are running, your production is running, things are changing, things are being added into the environment, files are being created. That all adds up too. That goes into the sort of um, uh, the retention, if you like, right? So as time progresses and your retention is growing, you're also going to have data and files grow. So if you have an understanding of that or kind of an idea of what it might be, that's also a very important thing to know. That's going to let you know if you can actually hit those seven year marks that you're looking for. Just an example again. Um, so that is just the, really the two, in my opinion, the two most important things uh, before we start. Without that knowledge, you could run a backup job. It may not finish. If you don't have enough storage, it may fail because of that as well. So to keep in mind, uh, if you're going to do a full deployment or just a dry run test, make sure you've got enough storage space um, to cover it. Now, SLA definitions. So these are covered. Everybody has SLA targets, SLA goals. What happens in an SLA situation? Well, uh, these are some of kind of the, um, the protection strategies, if you like, against certain scenarios that may or may not occur. You know, it's, it's one of those things as days progress, you know, it, things can go wild in just a single day in the IT world, as we know, right? Without any warning most of the time. So uh, if we implement Veeam, we're looking to obviously have more control and granular ability uh, to recover 
in case of these certain scenarios. One of them at the top of the list, especially with the way the environments of the world are today with work from home, um, is ransomware. So as I found, as we found, uh, you know, as the industry changes, so do the bad guys ways of doing things. Okay, they've always got to learn. We have always got to learn as IT staff. You know, we have to understand that things are going to change, infrastructure is going to change, technology is going to change. But they, the bad guys, know that too, right? And they're always learning to do things the bad way. So again, what things do you or will you have in place in your Veeam deployment that can protect you from ransomware attacks? You know, Veeam offers several different things. We have uh, mutability for on-prem Linux drives called the hardened Linux repository. Uh, being able to store your backups there, keep it protected from ransomware attacks. We also have cloud immutability options as well. So being able to send data to the cloud to an immutable space, uh, or even better yet, combining both of those things. So having an on-prem hardened Linux repository combined with a immutable storage space in the cloud, and you'll have multiple different locations to restore from in case of an attack. Difference is the ransomware cannot get to your um, repositories, so long as, of course, you were following the best practice guides. Now, the next SLA definition would be hardware failures. Okay, so that happens too. Hardware can fail. Again, what would you do in this scenario when you deploy Veeam? Well, uh, one of the things is, of course, uh, say it's a server, you have a physical server or even a virtual server that fails uh, or a whole host failure. We have replication, okay, that you can implement to spin up VMs on other hosts in other locations. We have instant recovery engine that allows you to immediately, well, not immediately, I would say very quickly, very rapidly within minutes, bring up a VM from its compress and dedupe state inside of the repository, mount it to a host location and run that uh, VM through compute. So with that comes that very minimal RTO window. It's very small. Um, so yeah, do you have those things in place? Will you? Another one is the physical disasters, fires, floods, some of us where we are in the world um, will have events such as this where your <clears throat> data center or physical building may come under attack by lightning or maybe a tornado or whatever it may be, right? Again, failovers of that data uh, or VMs that you have, failing over to another location out of harm's way, uh, having the cloud platforms available to you, being able to recover VMs into the cloud, uh, say AWS or Azure or even Google, uh, we could send data up that way as well. So things to keep you protected, turn these SLAs into quick restores, being able to quickly uh, walk out of a disaster. And then of course, data corruption happens too. Uh, so we have NAS backup, you know, we have uh, file share backup capability as well. Uh, we can get granular with the way we're recovering that data. So if there is any failures of any kind, say that a drive corrupts or a set of files corrupt, uh, you can restore those with a few clicks back into their original location, or you can push it externally to somewhere else, right? You, you wanna send it to another service, send it somewhere else out there on the network, you can do that too. So all of these things, and these are just some of the examples pulled from our best practice guide. I'm gonna put a link in the chat. So we, while this webinar can go, we can all check that out. So it is veeambp.com, that is the short link. If you go to that website, it will take you to the best practice guide uh, for backup and replication or uh, backup for Office 365. That's also included in there. Uh, sizing calculations is another one. Okay, so we mentioned, you know, getting the amount of data and getting the, you know, the change rate, but there are other things to look into that may be required for sizing, right? For example, your RTOs and RPOs. Okay, so your recovery time objectives and your recovery point objectives. So for sizing in this example, uh, recovery point objective is how many restore points are you planning on keeping, right? Uh, how many do you need? Um, how long are you gonna hold on to them for? Things of that nature, right? Are you gonna need uh, weeklies, monthlies, yearlies with GFS retention? So all that comes into play. So you really you wanna have an idea of how much storage you're gonna require. Again, for if, if say you wanted to have 30 days of restore points, uh, you wanna keep three weeks, six months, and like four years of GFS data, is that gonna also, uh, fit the bill in terms of storage requirement. And then RTOs, of course, is your recovery time objective. How quickly do you need to be back up and running? What's that window of time uh, to where, you know, you have one hour to get everything back up before we start seeing uh, the effects of a outage on the, on the business, okay? So again, sizing for that, 
restore times will depend on things like sizing out appropriately the amount of compute resources we're putting into the environment for availability of Veeam when it comes to restoring. Uh, having high speed disks uh, for mount points, for mount servers. If we're looking for a quick instant recovery, we're gonna need some quick um, storage. Faster storage will also give you a faster write rate and read rate, okay? Items of that nature to keep in mind as well when sizing it out. Uh, the next is the retention policy. Again, that kind of falls into RPO. It's kind of hand in hand with that, right? So how many resource points you want to keep over how long and how often are you going to perform a backup? So I want to keep, say, 45 um, or 42 resource points. I want to back up every hour, right? So that's 42 points of resource uh, availability there. Every hour backed up. So again, and that, of course, will require maybe some more resources since we're backing up and using resources through the business day. Um, some customers out there will have that requirement. So you want to make sure there's enough compute to sustain both production and backup uh, at the same time. And then we have backup window. Okay, so it does, obviously, there is a, a amount of time it takes for a backup to complete. Like I said, if it's hourly backups, it's going to be a window of time where resources are going to be used. Um, so in that event, what's going to be the best kind of deployment for you? And how many resources can you spare? Can you do a daily backup or an hourly backup? Um, can you have anything happening at business hours at all? Do you have the resource availability for that? So just keep that in mind when deploying as well, because the last thing we want to do is deploy Veeam and affect the production performance. Okay, so choose the right interval. Okay, next is a big, big rule, big important rule, the three, two, one rule. And this totally will govern how your restores go in those SLA events, right? If you don't have enough copies of your data and something goes wrong to where now, you know, now you don't have access to your data at all because you only had one copy. This is massively important when it comes to RTOs uh, and of course, maintaining those SLAs. So here, for those of you that don't know what the three, two, one rule is, uh, the three, so three copies of your data on two different media, with one copy off site, right? So you'll have a copy on prem, you'll then need a secondary copy going to another device, a different media altogether. So that could be uh, an external SSD or it could be a, a tape drive. There's a lot of tape out there that's still being used because it is technically one of the most still superior forms of air gapping, right? That's why it survived the test of time. Um, so you can put it on uh, the tapes and then one copy off site that is gonna be the cloud, or some other detached data center somewhere else in the world or in the country you're at, right? So um, with that, you have three points of failure instead of just one, right? So with that, if there's a failure of your main on-prem drive where your backups are going, well, you have a copy on a different media. I've got this external drive, I'll plug it in, restore from there, or I have it on tape, or there's ransomware and it's wiped everything out, but I still have a tape media with a backup like a restore my environment from, okay? Uh, one copy off site, I've lost it all. A meteor smacked into my building and now all the, everything's gone. Well, I can still recover data from the cloud copies I've sent up to the cloud. That gives me high availability of my data. So it's just some of the examples. Okay, now, next what we're going into is the lab. I'll just go over the first time setup, navigating and learning the UI, understanding where everything is and configuring initial backups. But first, before we do that, I'm going to check the questions. Let's see here. Okay. And forgive me, I'm reading the question. So if anybody has any other questions while I'm reading this one, uh, go ahead and throw those in now as well. Okay, Bill, excellent question. Very detailed. So with Linux Immutable, that's a brilliant question. Good, excellent. So um, with the Immutable storage, uh, the way it would work, uh, if you have the single server, we don't, well, best practices doesn't necessarily recommend having the Immutable on the same server as your backup server. And it, it should really be detached. Um, one of the recommendations is having a physical server standalone uh, with Linux OS built onto it, 
uh, one of the compatible versions that we work with, Ubuntu, for example, or Rocky. Um, I'm sorry, CentOS or, or uh, Red Hat, any one of those. Um, having it on its own separate physical server, and then, of course, having NFS formatted drives or XFS, I should say, sorry, XFS formatted drives on them ready to go. There is a guide on our website uh, that you can find under resources that will walk through the exact best practice steps for the hardening approach. There's a second step within there, but you're going to harden that drive, have it XFS formatted, uh, and that will be your standalone immutable space um, that is detached again and not associated with your backup server in that way. It's not on the same server. Um, the reason for that is because, of course, if there is a ransomware attack and it is to take out of your backup server itself, you're going to have a hard time restoring from those immutable backups because, you know, the server is now either unusable or there's some sort of thing that's stopping you from restoring. So if it's separate and you have it on it detached from that backup server and you did lose your backup server, for example, it's a simple case of restoring or creating a backup server to access that immutable storage and beginning that restore process because, you know, the licensing, we don't license the console, we license the workload. So you could spin up another VBR instance. It just gives you, um, again, a different point approach uh, for the best practice uh, situation. Now, when it comes to, I think another part of that was the cloud option too. So again, high availability. So you'll have your, if you had a separate Linux server that's you know on its own, isolated, uh, we have hardening on it, XFS, and it's configured and added to the Veeam console, which I'll show you in a second. Um, you can also have an S3 immutable storage location to send copies to as well. And that will still technically fall under the 321 rule at that point, right? So copies in your Linux hard, uh, hardened repo, scaling up and out to S3 immutable storage. All right, so that will probably be a good approach. Again, that best practice guide in the chat, if you find the section on Linux hardened repository, you'll see all of the details on deployment. Uh, good question too. Uh, the uh, Tim came in with, is Veeam able to backup snapshots from Dell Compellent storage? So uh, we have integrations with Compellent Series Sans. Uh, we do have the ability to sync up with that and see any previously created snapshots that may have been added. And we have application aware capability as well. Um, however, backing up the snapshots, not 100% sure, honestly. I don't believe so. Uh, I know we can create store, uh, backups from storage snapshots or snapshot-only jobs, um, which, will, again, will be created by us and will be synced up with that SAN, just landing on the SAN. Um, but uh, I could definitely pull some information on you to see if there is a way to do it. Uh, and then Bill had another question on the archive tier. Uh, the immutability for Azure. So as of right now, not right now. Uh, the reason behind it... Um, uh, it's just the, the nature of their storage type or model uh, being container-based. So we are currently working on that um, for the immutability option. So that's that's a roadmap. It's on the roadmap. Right now it's uh, S3, so Azure. I'm sorry, S3 for AWS. And there are a handful of um, S3 compatibles that we work with that have immutability as well. All right, cool. Excellent questions from everybody. Appreciate that. So let's get into the uh, Joe. Correct. Yes. Um, so in that case, we do have features like the Enterprise Manager, which is free. I just came in. Last question there, real quick. Um, the Enterprise Manager, which is free, and you can actually use that to manage multiple consoles in a single pane of glass. Uh, you should have it in your install. You can go to the website and download the Enterprise Manager. Also has license management in there as well. Okay, so we have backup and replication open. So we're going to go over the first time set up, and I'm going to be pretty general. So as I'm going through, throw a question out there, I'll happily answer it. Um, so this is obviously the main home tab. Um, Tim, yes, I'll be doing a brief on the Veeam One platform as well. So yep, absolutely, that'll be part of the. Uh, the availability suite there. So the general setup is backup infrastructure. This is where you're going to find a lot of the core components uh, that Veeam will require to run um, to at least back up. So again, proxies, deploying the proxies, adding them in, sizing those appropriately. Uh, the proxies, of course, are the data movers. Are also, you could think of the Veeam console as the orchestrator or the beehive, um, and the proxies are the bees. Okay, so they're just doing all the heavy lifting. Uh, they're using CPU in this case to perform tasks, 
concurrent tasks. So obviously the higher the availability, the more tasks this single proxy can perform. Uh, so with that, again, uh, a task can be a restore, it could be a moving of data, uh, backing up of data, it could be really anything there. Uh, so just keep that in mind too. Storage, completely agnostic. We do not need or require any particular kind of storage. We are agnostic when it comes to that. So uh, in that case, we do have some DD appliances available. I know the compellent sand question got brought up. So we do have compellent uh, integrations right here. There we go. Excellent. So we can integrate with Dell storage systems. We have Cisco Hyperflex, uh, HPE, Nimble, Primera, uh, 3PAR, uh, the Spectrum Virtualized from IBM, NetApp, with solid fire as well, and there's a bunch more. Like the list goes on. Okay, so pure storage, that's another one out there. Um, and then from there, of course, everything else is the scale out ability. So, scale out repository is how we get to the cloud. Uh, another thing, too, if anybody's out there with storage concerns and having storage availability, as you can see here under capacity tier, uh, it is all maintained under copy mode and move mode. So combining both of those, copy mode will create a copy of your backups and send the copy to the cloud. Move mode will move the data as it ages out um, to the cloud. If this is disabled, then this is going to move the data that's older to the cloud. Be careful of that as well. Um, if you had 60 days of retention and you said move anything older than 40 days, that's quite a large amount of data we're offloading to the cloud at once. So uh, another approach is to enable copy mode. So we're doing daily copies or whenever your backups are being you know sent up there and then move mode will not send duplicates to the cloud but rather clean up and maintain the on-prem storage so just delete the on-prem data if a copy already exists in the cloud so that way you can keep your data maintained uh, within a short window short term on-prem long term in the cloud okay after that inventory so again adding our servers in this is where we'll add to the uh, the list of available vms we have vmware Capability, Hyper-V, Nutanix, and physical workloads, so bare metal servers. This is a way for you to deploy agents quickly and centrally to multiple different servers and protect those physical workloads. So that's your general setup uh, and everything else is just backup jobs, very simple. Uh, just one, since we are limited on time, I will show you this. Uh, so if anybody has Veeam currently, awesome. Um, if you knew about this feature, even better, you, you like, uh, checking out the hidden secrets here. Um, but if you do not have Veeam, I would definitely suggest going out and getting yourself a trial or talking to your uh, account representative and getting a call cool set up to get into the, the actual flow. But if you hit F1, the F1 key at any point during anything you're doing inside of the console, it will send you to the exact step that you're on or location that you're on with an explanation into the uh, functionality. Uh, Bill, uh, that is uh, something you can do when it comes to protecting your backup server um, is to have it either on its own DMZ, so it's a network segregated out from the rest of the environment. So almost off the domain, but not quite. Uh, or you could take the workload approach uh, where you just put it on its own work group, if you like, off the domain. Off the domain, may you may have some issues unless you have a pretty tight, like, um, um, port forwarding policy, have ports going, because there is a, a big list of ports requirement uh needed for communication within or into a domain um if you're willing to put in you know uh the work of adding those in awesome just go ahead and do it and isolate it uh otherwise dmz will be fine too i've seen a lot of that too just having its own separate away network which is heavily secured uh something else you'd love to hear though mfa is coming as well that is coming as on the roadmap um so that's another layer of security you can add to add that human element uh, to log into the Veeam console. So that's going to be a big one. And I agree, Veeam is awesome. <laughs> Love to hear it. All right, cool. So um, with that, that's pretty much right now. Let's quickly get into Veeam 1. Again, Veeam 1 and combination there will be the availability suite. And this is the monitoring and analytical side, which again, takes a lot of footwork uh, out of having to manually go through, monitor your environments, have your, you know, your Windows-based monitoring solutions that you may have um, embedded into the server, you know, looking at all of the different resources and what you need. But Veeam 1 takes a lot of the guesswork out. 
It gives you access to a lot of different reports to that help you analyze your own environment. Within a few clicks, we can create these reports and put them onto a PDF document. So it makes it super, super easy. Um, so with that, let's get into the basics. So virtual, the infrastructure view is gonna show you a list of all your virtual servers, your hosts, uh, for any of these environments, as you can see, including backup and replication. And the cool thing about that is, uh, where backup and replication does have standard notifications of success, warning, failure, um, the Veeam One application has alarms pre-built into the software that list all of the deeper components of Veeam. There is a lot of different alarms. Uh, so it's able to monitor all of the inner workings uh, of the engine, essentially. So if anything goes wrong, it will show you an alert, it will send you an alarm, and it will list off the information about why that alarm's being triggered, the knowledge base, the cause, and the resolution of how to fix it, or take a look at how to get you towards correcting the issue. So excellent feature there. Uh, the infrastructure view is gonna be a generalized overview of everything. So basically this is my host, uh, I'm sorry, I said that there. there we go. Here's my host cluster. Uh, we have alarms generalizing across all of the hosts. So we have some host alarms, some VM alarms, what have you. Uh, we have VMs, so individually. We give us a rundown of your information, IP addresses, all that good stuff. Uh, the hosts, Overall CPU, memory, network, data store, top VMs for usage, uh, lowest load, and then task and events. Uh, so it gets really granular with what you can see, but it keeps it all centralized. You know, you don't have to go all over the place and jump all around to try and get these key specifics. You know, you don't have to open up Event Viewer in Windows. You don't have to do this out in the other. Uh, you can all do it from here. So it makes the management very easy. Uh, business View is one of my favorites. So Business View here is... Uh, basically a way for you to compartmentalize your own environment into specific segments. So for example, SLA, mission critical VMs, right? Boom, here's all of our stuff that has to be running and if it doesn't, we're in trouble. Okay, so you can have alarms catered to this specific group. And as you can see, it's a full list of prefabbed alarms. If you've created any custom ones, they'll be in there as well. Uh, but you can say, hey, uh, let's see, disk space, that's pretty critical, right? Uh, so we can select that, okay. Sweet, there we go. So we created a mission critical alarm set and define those alarms for this particular VM. So you can exclude them right there, as you can see. Exclude or include. So this is a full list of alarms associated with these VMs. Now with the editing of specific alarms, we can right click and go to alarm, define alarm again. Oh, sorry, my bad. Let's go over to, apologies. This is creating a new business group. Uh, let's just go ahead and create one. Give me a second here. There we go. Add a category. Boom, here we go. Cool. So give the category a name. Let's say, uh, I'm trying to think of something. Um, let's say disk failures. There we go. Sure. Uh, type virtual machine. Let's do host. Okay. Categorization, so do we do single parameter, multi-condition? So as you can see, you can choose exactly what happens. You can also set it to grouping expressions, right? So manually set everything, verify. You can hit the editor and add your own expressions in, which is awesome. So if anybody's into that, you can actually build a whole slew of things inside of here, add it, save it, and that'll be your expression for the actual alarm trigger. So very awesome features there. And like I said, it makes it easy. When you create these categories, uh, you can set, you know, things like, VM location, European Union, United States, in the West. Uh, VMs with backups, yes or no. So you, it makes it really easy for you to see these things. Uh, let's see, now next is data protection view. So again, being able to see a Veeam side of things, what's going on here, how much storage am I using, how many resources am I using, uh, what are my proxies doing, what are my tape servers doing? So you get the idea, it gives you a more in-depth look into what's going on in your backup environment. And then of course we can also, again, define alarms. We can model an alarm and define an alarm uh, for the backup server. And as for alarms, this is a full list of alarms available to you. This is a general, so all alarms. Massive list, look at the size of that list. Huge, huge, huge list. So the alarms that we have, some of these will have definitions. And like I said, some of them are gener generated automatically. Um, as you can see, we can go through and see a knowledge base, the cause, the, how to solve it and, and uh, resolve that issue. Uh, we have Hyper-V environment specific alarms as well. 
So again, all these Hyper-V specific errors that we get or may get, verified to, uh, failed to verify the VM configuration file. Again, a little breakdown. And then the backup server as well. So all of these alarms going into the under the hood components of Veeam, showing you these errors that may happen inside of it. You know, uh, let's see, job takes longer than usual, right? So again, it's going to give you a rough understanding of what to look in, look at, where to go, things to try and fix. Also, upgrade the Veeam to this particular patch. It'll take it to the website. There we go. There's the patch. Download it. You know, it takes a lot of the legwork out, as I said. So lots of cool things. Now, the reporting element. Uh, let's see. There is a reporter. Once you've built your Veeam console out, it's a web-based client uh, that I like to call my morning coffee routine, right? So when I wait, when I'm getting into work, I want to take a look at things like what's going on today. That was the wrong password. That's also the wrong password. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, there we go. Cool. So what's going on today? Well, this is a dashboard that I can use. It's again synced up with uh, with Veeam One, and it collects data from it um, from the actual Veeam One infrastructure. And you can create dashboards. Okay, so being able to create little, uh, let's say, widgets inside this dashboard to give you a general look of what's going on. So I have a heat map here. Cool. So proxy usage. It's all green. Cool. Excellent. Uh, I got some repository free space issues here. Might be something we need to look into. Okay, so put that on the agenda. Um, let's take a look at my vSphere hosts and clusters. Any memory ballooning? No, nope, looks pretty solid. Nice. Um, CPU write, uh, read rate went down, so it was obviously busy around this time or this date. But as the dates progress, things have been balancing out, which is nice. Um, some of these hosts are eating some memory. We have some, we're down on the network, which is great. We're using less network resources. And then we have growing guest disks. So, yeah, there's a lot of red in here, right? So again, we have to look into that. So again, makes it easy. Makes it easy for you to look and see exactly what you need to look out for. And then we do have custom dashboards as well. So you can create your own widgets as well, of course. Um, some of these will be prefabbed inside of here. Reports. So these are PDF reports you can create. Again, huge list of variety for VMware and Veeam backup environments, Nutanix as well. Uh, let's do, let's take a look at capacity planning. So capacity planning for backup repository. So it will show based on the metrics. And it's going to, again, Veeam will actually, uh, uh, Veeam 1 will collect that data and store it in this database. And obviously the more it collects, the more it can pick up on trends. So basically it's able to see uh, the change rates. It makes change rate very easy. So based on utilization threshold currently, can I hit this retention? Um, and do I have enough free space? And it will show you at this point, either no, you don't for that um, threshold you entered, or it will show you a progression of time saying, hey, at this point, say 25 days in, you may start seeing um, drives being filled up. Right, so again, it gives you a good foresight into your deployment plans of your environment. Same thing for VMware, you know, capacity planning for VMware, how many more VMs can be provisioned. We could do host failure modeling. Uh, in case of a failure, what's the utilization that we'll have based on the metrics that we collected in the Veeam1 database. Okay, so absolutely good. And just an FYI as well, when I say collecting, this is not going to us. This data is solely yours. This is your data that you own that is gonna be on that server. None of that data gets collected by Veeam there in that instance. Okay, so Tim, I'm going back to questions now. That is pretty much the rundown of uh, Veeam 1 there. And again, lots of different things to look out for, but that is the availability suite. So I'm just going to switch back to uh, the slide. We've done the demo. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to answer some questions here. Um, answer a uh, no, question from Tim. Do we have a hard date for the release on V12? No. We do not, unfortunately, not yet. Um, there are whispers, of course, but I'll try not to run off of those. But um, no hard dates as of right now, but you will absolutely see the information be released. If you have a Veeam account, you'll get the notification uh, when we all start talking about it. So keep an eye out for that.
Um, okay, so Bill, question for you. The 365, you're going to be backing up 365. Awesome. Uh, can you send it to Immutable? Not directly from 365. Again, the backup 365 it is a JET database, right? So um, when it comes to sending it to storage locations right now, we can send it to direct attached storage, so standard drives. Um, we can't send it to Immutable, but we can send it now with V6. We can send copies to archive tiers. They're not Immutable archive tiers, but they are indeed cloud archive tiers. So AWS archive and Azure archive. If you wanted to get the Immutability and you have backup and replication already, you can grab the files using backup and replication and send those copies of that data to an Immutable space. That'll be your work workaround in this case. Uh, will Veeam One report to monitor Linux agents? Um, good question. Let's find out together. Let's take a look. Apologies, I should know that. Um, let's see. I do not believe so. Agents is limited. So if we go to data protection view, uh, we can see jobs. Let's choose this one. So we can monitor the jobs that are happening uh, for virtual machines. And uh, there are some limitations there as well. So I'm not 100%. That was a recent update. There are going to be some improvements coming in, but I'll send you the information on the monitoring capability uh, for any agents. Correct. The link for agents is basically agent jobs, right? So agent policies. So that's more of your backup jobs. If you're looking at monitoring the backup job, absolutely. Uh, we can monitor the jobs in terms of what they're doing, uh, but if it's the agent itself, not really, but just the jobs through the console. Absolutely, Bill. Appreciate all of your time today as well. Um, just a few things as well. I wanted to go through um, the links, the available links to you. Uh, anybody out there that does not have a Veeam account, go ahead and create one, um, and you'll have access to my.veeam.com. Uh, that is a big old place for resources, um, general information, registering yourself for webinars such as this one, um, licensing policy, you can talk to one of our sales uh, representatives if you're interested in uh, moving forward with him and starting the process of, of uh, you know, demos, POCs, things of that nature. Uh, and then we have the community forums, that's a big one. Definitely go there, forums.veem.com, uh, it is a has a plethora of information when it comes to how Veeam operates. There's real world customers out there sharing their experiences with Veeam uh, tips. We have the vanguards that go in there as well. Those are our Veeam elite uh, out there who are just 100% all for Veeam, which is awesome. And they're very knowledgeable and they're very helpful as well. Uh, and then there's the top free tools. Again, lots of free tools, sizing tools, uh, specifically for backup from application, backup for 365, uh, some of our other products as well, capacity planning tools, and resource point simulators, things of that nature. Um, but that pretty much covers it for today's webinar. I'd like to appreci I appreciate all of you. I'd like to thank you all for asking those great questions. I hope this was helpful, uh, but hopefully we'll see you again soon. Again, have a great day, and thank you for joining.